Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Anne Marie Band on the on the line. She is a author and financial analyst. She's a trader. She wrote a book, The Trading Book Course: A Practical Guide to Profiting with Technical Analysis. Anne Marie, how are you doing this morning? I am doing quite well. I hope you are. Yeah. Are you getting acclimated to this Michigan weather yet? You know, it's been glorious actually. I'm sure in three months when the wind is blowing at 30 below, I won't be saying that, but the wind blowing now is just phenomenal. I'm absolutely loving it, but I can feel the chill starting to set. Yeah, you just wait till those leaves start to change colors <laughs> and uh, the fall comes around. It's a great season here. But uh, anyways, getting to the markets, uh, Dennis and I were just talking about the Yahoo and the Alibaba. And I know you're a technician, so there were no technicals on Alibaba uh, since it was his first day of trading. Is this something that you get involved in or is this just something that you let the dust settle a little bit? Actually, believe it or not, because the market is fractal, as soon as Alibaba printed 10 minutes of candlesticks, you could trade it on formation. Um, that's, that's really a beautiful thing. So I did not touch Alibaba because I was a little concerned about how the stock would behave because of the lockout rules that were so different for Alibaba as opposed to other things. So what I did was trade Yahoo, which was much more straightforward. And we actually saw the dip in Yahoo coming, so we were short last week coming into the Alibaba trade. And uh, so that's two questions there in one, but you actually can trade using Fibonacci's if you just let the first five-minute candlestick rotate, and once you get to that second one, um, there's a lot more going on. Now, the first candlestick on the five-minute chart anticipated a touch of 100, but people came in front of that, obviously, and knocked it down. And um, so really, all you have to do is follow that retrace in. For us, we were looking for the weakness to develop in Yahoo so that we could add to the trade significantly. And we saw that the 50 simple moving average, I tweeted this actually on Friday, the 50 simple moving average on the four hour chart was somewhere around 3970-ish. And uh, we anticipated that to be the floor because it also essentially filled the gap that had been sitting from somewhere around September the what day? Is right, that? I see that. Yeah, I do. It yeah, did like fill September the gap. September the eighth. Gap filled yeah. So were you were you short the stock? Were you sh did you use the options, options market? Oh, okay. So did you go with yeah. the spread or did you just go with the outright puts? No, the outright puts. Okay. What strike? Did you just use the Friday expiration? Or were you, like, were you just playing no, just for that day we, or you went out further? Yeah, we went out into this week. And okay. the reason that we do that is because, you know, if you're right, then you are just sitting so pretty. But if you're wrong, it just is it's worthless. a slaughterhouse. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, there's, there's blood in the street. Oh, I know wrong. that. So, oh, I know it's that. zero. Your option's worth nothing if you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, as always, you have to weigh the measure of risk to reward and decide what is most prudent. And, and often, as day traders, we tend to be a little bit um, more uh, risk-loving than we should be. In general, this is my thought anyway, as I, I work with uh, traders, I, I tend to see them being overly risky. And uh, there's plenty of, you don't have to make all of your money in one day. If you're a mouse that just goes for a little piece of cheese every day, you'll be just fine. <laughs> Anne Marie, was it was it fundamentals that uh, kicked you off, or technicals? Because I I did a piece uh, last week on the technicals and Yahoo before it, and the thing that stuck out to me was the multiple closes in one area. I mean, you you had the spike high above forty five. 
But I looked at the 42.55 to 42.88 level, 42.88, marking you know the highest close of the move, and you had four closes actually right in that same area. So to me, I was thinking, man, they've got there's someone letting some stock go at that area, and I felt safe shorting it around that area because you know I felt I had some company. So was there was there something in the technicals you saw fundamentals, or was it just a gut feeling? Well, I don't ever trust my gut um, because, you know, sometimes you can be wrong. And so you can have a gut feeling, but for me as an analyst, I must look for empirical evidence that says that there is some measure of truth to what it is that I'm feeling in my solar plexus right there. And so (laughs) interestingly enough, that level is that level that you called right there sat at the five simple moving average on the four-hour chart, which I love the four-hour. And that five simple moving average was a region that you could see a lot of arguing going on. And when there's a lot of arguing and it squeezes in tightly like that, you know if it breaks on either side, it's the levy that's broken. And so if it broke on that side from a support perspective, the most natural thing for folks to do would be to buy it back up into that region. And if it bought back up into the region and failed, that's when the trade short was most efficient. And for us, that's really what we were looking for to add to the position. Now, Yahoo had given us a measured move up into the 44 area. So we knew that this move was over, but we didn't know whether it would sit sideways for a bit and continue up or go down. But when they all started collecting at that 4260-ish area, it was the region for us to say, you know what, we need to pay attention here because if this gets broken, It's going to get retested because the trend upward is so strong. People are waiting to buy. The psychology of the event is that, okay, it's holding here. If it pulls back at all, I'm going to add. But if you don't know that the measured move is over, that's what you're going to do. You're going to add. But if you know the measured move's over, you know it's going to fail, you know it's going to retest, and the retest is going to tell whether the buyers have any strength to push it back up and over. And if it fails, we know we've got the downside. And so the great thing about technical analysis is that you can have a great deal of patience watching the trade set up for you to have the lowest risk and the highest reward. And a lot of times that really does mean you've got to sit on your hands. And for us, in terms of adding to that position, we definitely had to sit on our hands until the retest of that event. Anne-Marie, what are your thoughts here on BABA itself? Because we had a pretty wild day, obviously, on Friday. The stock kept climbing up on indications, opened finally at 92, quickly ran to 99. Pulled all the way back, and then it looked like somebody was defending the $90 level because for about an hour and 20 minutes, it just traded and hugged the $90 level before it started to rally up a bit in the afternoon and then closed fairly strong on a large buy imbalance at the end of the day. And then a dollar, Now it's down a dollar and a half here in the pre-market, giving back a lot of those afternoon gains. What are your thoughts here from a technical perspective going forward today on BABA? Well, you hit the nail on the head right right there about this 89, 99 area that somebody was defending. Here's the thing. If the pressure from above, as this drifts down in the pre-market, right, if this pressure from above begins to build and the chart loses, there are two areas of what I perceive to be fundamental support Um, from a technical perspective, of course, that area is right around 91 and then 90. If it breaks 91, we really ought to watch what's going on. But if it loses this 89, 90-ish area, it means that everybody defending there is gone. And so what you're going to have to do is take out your Fibonacci tool 
and measure down from 89.95 all the way up to 99.70 and look for the 127 retracement. The 127.2 retracement is the next most likely rejection point for the chart. And that seems to be, as I look down here, somewhere around 87.24. For me, like I said earlier in our conversation, I am very concerned about exactly how the current holders of large pockets of stock are going to treat this particular um, instrument. I do not know that yet. And really, it's because there's a lot that could be released onto the market simply because of you know how the um, the stock is structured here with Alibaba. It's not traditional, and so there's a lot of stock that could hit the market. So I'm still going to watch that for a couple of days. Yahoo's going to tell me the way. I believe Yahoo will actually telegraph this move, or maybe they'll move in sync. What I see, of course, is Yahoo coming down into that same relative support area. And if it bounces, I'm pretty sure that Alibaba is going to bounce as well. And so I'm going to be watching these guys in sync playing Yahoo as the best derivative because it has the strongest price patterns for me to follow. And after Alibaba's put in a couple of weeks, uh, then I will step into this one. But I am being uh, uh, a little conservative about putting my money at risk in here, only because you never know where the bid-ask is going to drop out to or how wide the spread is going to get or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's my thought there. If it loses that 89, it means everything that was supporting that 89.90 89.95 area is going to be vaporized. And if it's gone, you have to look at the next measured move event. And the only way that algorithms are going to do that is by, you know, using the Fibonacci sequence or another type of measured move event. And Marie, I was discussing with a buddy of mine uh, about that fib retracement that you talked about. And, and like Dennis, I've always been a big 50% retracement guy, but mm -hmm. I've never explain that, that extension, that 1.25 Fibonacci extension, because that's worked out pretty well in the markets. And also for me, when the, when the S and P's or when stocks get to levels that are like all time highs or all time lows, you know, I kind of I kind of struggle to find numbers, but he was pointing out that 1.25 fib. Could you just go into that in a little bit more detail for us? Well, the fib that I have is the 1.272, and 1.25 works well also because it's a GAN number, and you can look at those 25, 50, and 75 percent retracement levels, and they work quite adequately. The thing to remember about a fib is that it's a range. It's not an exact number because we're all trying to jockey around and uh, play the game with each other. So it ends up being a particular range. Now, the 127.2 retracement event is a very common part of a measured move within something called an ABCD pattern, right? And so for an ABCD pattern, it goes up into that, it can go up into 50%, it can go up into 61.8, into it could be very shallow at 38.2. But then that extension of 127.2 and then into the golden ratio of 1.618, that's a very likely reversal pattern that happens very often in the market. Now, why it happens? You know, I don't really look for causation. I look for correlation because I'm playing a probabilities game. And so I don't care why. Um, I just care that. And so that's what I will look for. And I will use my momentum indicators to tell me if it is likely that I bounce at that level or if I collapse through that level. So if you struggle with those spaces that you're looking for, I recommend that you look at the first one that seems reasonable to you and then use whatever momentum indicator you like. I, of course, like the stochastic momentum index. 
That's my favorite indicator. I find it to be the most reliable. But wherever that comes in, that tells me whether I'm going to chop sideways, collapse through the level and retest, or collapse into the next likely level. And so I will use those two things in combination to help me decide whether that's a place I try to pick a bottom or if it's a place that I close a trade or if it's a place that I, that I think is going to be some sort of reversal that I need to wait for a confirmation or a retest of that level to move into the trade. Anne-Marie, let's get your thoughts here on the overall market. We had a pretty wild day there on Friday. Obviously, everybody was talking about Baba, but the spoos were bouncing around here pretty good. We had some individual moves where some stocks were going up or really down on the close here. Now we're coming in this morning. We're seeing the S&P futures down seven points. Is there any cause for concern here? Because we know historically on these quadruple, which these can be turning days. Did you see anything from the trading action on Friday which make you think that this bull market might be a little bit uh, in danger here? You know what? That is not what um, I saw. Now, first of all, I am a short-term trader, right? So okay. I will either day trade or short-term swing trade. And if we're looking at the ES, if you want to go to maybe uh, somewhere around, let's see, the 9th of September, the chart began to form a very sloppy inverted head and shoulders. And for us, we had a measured move into 2015 at the top of um, the breakout of the moving av of the, of the uh, inverted head and shoulders. And so it got to 2014.5 pre-market, and I thought, all right, if that's a strong level, we're going to retest it during the day. It did not. That's always a sign of weakness, or very often a sign of weakness. And so we expected the retest of the breakout level and the completed um, retrace when you have a chart like ours, the ES is essentially sideways. The SBX has been very sloppy and sideways in a very big formation that's ugly. So we always, re uh, we always expect that retest. And so now here, we're back at the very same breakout level and bouncing. I bet we get to 2003 today. It seems reasonable that we should climb into that resistance level, somewhere between 2002 and 2003, which is the frontline resistance. What's happening with the market right now? I think it's choppy and sideways. I don't see any cause for concern. Um, you know, a lot of us try to press technical indicators down into spaces where the market has no form. And like I say to my folks all the time, garbage in, garbage out. If you've got a garbage chart with garbage form and nothing trending, and you try to put momentum indicators or trending indicators, which is all we have, on top of our charts, we're going to get garbage. And as we move through time frames, they're going to tell us all kinds of different things. And so it's going to be a big, fat, muddy mess. So if we look at it as a big, fat, muddy mess, then the easiest thing to do is choose measured moves. If something like Joel was talking about, that 50% move, you can measure down from 1965 um, up to that 2014, and you'll see that very interesting 50% mark just underneath where the market began to bounce this morning. That likely is going to be a place that we play around in for a while. We may very well revisit it if we can't hold 2002. But I really don't see any cause for concern in the space right now. Now, if you are looking at intermediate moves and you're thinking about holding something for five, six months, I can't tell you. Okay. What's that sounds good. We got Amory Ben on the line. She's an author and financial analyst. She wrote the book, A Practical Guide to Profiting with Technical Analysis. Anne Marie, we still haven't seen you in the office yet, so we need you to stop I by the know. world headquarters here, okay? I will do it. Okay, thank you, Anne Marie. Great look at the markets, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks again. See you later. Bye bye. Thanks, Anne Marie.